Pass it over to Will now. Kia ora koutou katoa. Haere mai nō mai, ko tātou hui hui ngā tēnei rā. Um, welcome everybody to our message today. And today we're going to be looking at Te Tiriti o Waitangi and the Treaty of Waitangi. So there's two different versions. One's Te Reo Māori and the other's in English. And we're going to be looking at some of the events that led to the signing of Te Tiriti o Waitangi. Uh, my name is Will Westrup and I'm one of the elders at Life Switch Church here. But just before I start, I'd like to pray. E tō mātou mātou i te rangi, ki e tapu tu ingoa. Mā ringi nō tō wairua tapu ki runga mātou i tēnei rā, e whakamohio mātou, te rongo pai, e kōrero mai ana ki e ia mātou. Lord, we want to bless you and thank you for this day. I pray you pour out your spirit upon us and give us understanding of what you want to say to us today. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. I have a scripture up here, and, and this comes from Psalm 24, verse 1, which says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. So here's a declaration that God um, owns the Fenua, everything. And in this scripture here, this comes from um, Acts chapter 17, and this is the occasion where Paul is on the Areopagus and he's speaking to a whole of the so called wise people at the, t at the time and he says this from one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands god did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him though he is not far from any one of us so that's an amazing thing. So God actually sets boundaries of where people ought to be. So he's speaking right throughout history, declaring that he is here. And uh, God continues to speak today through his word, through his people, through his prophets. And here's a prophecy that I want to bring to your attention, which came to Aotearoa before the missionaries came to New Zealand. And uh, the, the matakite, and that's the term for a seer, a prophet, uh, think of Samuel the prophet, a seer. So uh, a matakite uh, is a similar person, a prophet. And he lived in Mahia near Turanga Nui Akiwa. So Mahia is here, just above Napier on that peninsula there, that area. And just above it, Turanga Nui Akiwa is the Gisborne area. So um, Arama Toiro, Te Toiro, uh, was telling people about a people who would be coming to Aotearoa, coming to New Zealand. And they would be coming in vessels very different to what they travelled in, wakas. And he would actually draw them and he would, he would make shapes. And um, he would take a burning stick and put it on the top and saying there would be smoke coming from this thing. And another thing he would do, he would take small lengths of stick, have them burning and put it in his mouth. And these people would have these things. And then he also made copies of the, the clothing. Uh, he made it out of flax. He made trousers a jacket. He also made tall hats of what these people would be wearing. But he said something really important about these people. They were going to be coming with a really good message about their God. And uh, he made this prophecy here. Te ingoa o tō rātou atua, ko tama i rorokutia. He ahua e atua pai, o tira ka ngaro ano te tangata. So what that means in English is the name of their God will be Tama Irorokutia, which in English means son who was killed. So who was the son that was killed? Jesus, the son of God. And so he's actually prophesying the coming of the gospel. A good God, however, the people will still be oppressed. So he was talking about the people living in Aotearoa, that oppression would come upon them despite this good message that was coming. So the prophetic voice of the gospel came first to Tangata Whenua within New Zealand, to people of the land, through a prophet living in the land. And God will continue to do this today. So let's have a look at the events that actually led up to the um, signing of the Tiriti Waitangi. 
Uh, in the background here, I just want to make a note here, this is a picture of one of the documents of the, the actual treaty itself. There are nine documents all together, and it's not just on one manuscript. And the reason for that is when it was actually signed, copies were made in Waitangi, and then uh, they were transported around the country by missionaries who accompanied Māori, who travelled with them, and they went to different hapu iwi right throughout Aotearoa, North Island, South Island, to have these signed. And this was over a period of time of about nine months. On the actual day that the treaty was signed, on the 6th of February, 1840, at Waitangi, which is up in the Bay of Islands, there were 43 rangatira, or chiefs, who signed on that particular day, besides Hobson, uh, on behalf of the uh, British Crown. And then, over the next nine months, other signatories were added, and about 540 chiefs signed, or rangatira, and within that, um, that number, there were 13 women who also signed. There would have been more, but there was actually a wee bit of attitude from the missionaries who felt this was actually the men's domain and should just be the men who signed it. But actually within Te Ao Māori, women have standing, and in some places they actually led their particular hapu. And so uh, Māori, when they give their whakapapa, they can actually whakapapa either on the matriarchal side or patriarchal on the male side. So uh, they didn't worry about waiting till uh, um, universal suffrage for women to vote. They already had it. Right? We're doing okay. So here we go. Here's the list here. So some of the factors. Uh, one was lawlessness in Kororareka. Kororareka, the name of that today is Russell, up in the Bay of Islands. And this was a hive of industry in the early 1800s. And the reason for that is Cook, when he travelled around New Zealand, described it as a really safe harbour, good place to anchor, and there is actually lots of provisions to be found in the area, spars for ships where repairs can be done. And also by this time in the early 1830s, Māori, because of the introduction of crops through missionaries, particularly Samuel Marsden, who uh, wanted to teach local Māori about agriculture and to actually grow crops, and he, his vision was that Māori would actually be trading internationally. And so as a result of this, they, they grew lots of vegetables, wheat. They also built um, flour mills, and, and they provided for ships that actually came into the area. In fact, it was so popular, this area, there are up to a thousand ships, whaling vessels, sealers, would come into this area here. And having been out at sea for so long, they would be really thirsty. And the other thing that they really wanted was women. And because of this, there was a lot of fighting. Grog shops, uh, grog shops had opened up and there was a lot of prostitution. Missionaries were upset. Local Māori were upset by this. In fact, we were so upset in 1831, they had actually written a letter to uh, King William IV back in England asking for his help and also for protection. And what they were asking for is, could you do something about controlling Europeans who are actually in our land? Um, you know, they welcomed the trade, but they didn't want that sort of behaviour. So in 1835, we have what we call um, He Whakaputanga, the Declaration of Independence of the uh, Northern Tribes of Aotearoa. This was declared in 1835. And what they were saying in this declaration was that Nutirena, New Zealand, was an independent, independent sovereign nation. And King William IV recognised this in 1836. So when we came up to when it, we came up to signing the treaty in 1840, it was actually a signing between two independent nations. And so this was recognised by the Crown. But things get a bit tricky, and we'll have a look at that in a moment. Um, another thing that actually had a, a major devastating impact, actually, within Aotearoa with the musket wars. So in around about 1809, there was a battle that was fought at Muramonui, which is up on the north above the Kaipara Harbour area. 
and uh, that was fought between Ngāpuhi and Ngāti Whātua, two big uh, iwi Ngāti Whātua uh, from just below Whangarei down towards uh, Orake in Auckland itself, so big area, then you've got the northern tribes there. And at this particular battle, uh, there was a toa. A toa is a war party of about 500 um, warriors were travelling down and they were going out on a, um, on a raid on Ngāti Whātua. But Ngāti Whātua actually heard about them coming down and they had uh, hidden themselves. So when the uh, toa from uh, Ngāpuhi had settled down in a particular area uh, by a stream to settle in, they were actually attacked and a battle uh, was fought there. And a number of their, their leaders were actually... Uh, Ngāpuhi leaders were actually killed and uh, then when they withdrew about 150 of their warriors had actually been killed and um, a young man at the time uh, um, Hongi Hiki remembered this particular battle this was about 1808 with missionaries coming into the area um, he had began to travel with them and in about 1820 I think it is he travelled to England with Kendall. And while there, uh, he was treated like a wee bit of a, a superstar um, and uh, met with uh, King William. And King William gave him gifts, including a suit of armour. And um, what Hongihika, um, what uh, Hongihiki did with these, rather, is when he came back to Australia, when they called him there, he actually sold his goods and bought muskets. So what he had in mind, so remember 18, about 1808, 1809, the Battle of Mōmōrānui took place. One of the things within a Māori is if somebody offended you or they had actually done some damage uh, to you or to your hapu, you then actually had to carry out what they call utu, revenge. So he had this in mind and he came back armed with muskets. And so uh, the musket wars actually started in 1809. They had some muskets then, but this time had better equipped. And as a result, he sent out on a um, raiding parties down again to Ngāti Whātua territory, and they actually armed with these muskets, and actually a lot of people were actually killed. Unfortunately, this actually set off like a powder keg right across New Zealand, where uh, iwi wanted to get hold of muskets, in order to protect themselves, and others thought they need to go and settle Utu. So for um, right into the, the, about the 1830s, early 1830s, a lot of fighting took place among Māori, between Māori, and actually those um, people who were um, immigrants in the country, they were actually ignored. Um, and um, this led to uh, a number of iwi being decimated. And the other thing was boundaries changed, where some iwi went and wiped out the local inhabitants and then claimed their area as their own. And a you know, similar thing happened here in the, uh, in the Wellington area here, where you have uh, Ngāti Toa, who had come down from Raglan area there, Atiawa, who had moved down this area into the Kapiti, fought with local Māori there, took over those particular areas, um, Te Rauparaha was the leader there, set up on Kapiti Island as his base and uh, also a lot of fighting took place here. We've got, um, what's the name of the golf course, Clint? Um, in Lower Hutt, pardon? Your Bork Up Farm. That was an uh, area where fighting took place among Māori. Another one is yeah, Battle Hill. And so those all have stories and this happened during this particular period of time. And um, as a result of that, there was instability among Māori. And also during this time, missionaries were kept up in the, the northern area and um, Hongiheka. Uh, he wanted them there. And the reason for that was that he wanted to use them in order to gain muskets. And so uh, during this time, You'd think they'd be preaching the gospel, but they, they couldn't because they were actually kept in those areas that couldn't get out. Um, another contributor, a contributing factor to the Treaty of Waitangi 
actually being signed was the New Zealand Company. And this was um, set up by a couple of brothers, Wakefield brothers, and their goal was to get rich quick. And they came up with a scheme of coming out to New Zealand, buying land cheaply of the uh, indigenous people, and then selling it uh, at a profit, high profit, to um, people like the gentry back in England. And one of the things he did, which was really cheeky, started dividing up New Zealand before he even saw the place and started selling off property. So new immigrants, when they arrived here, particularly when they came to Wellington here, which is known as Port Nicholson here, immigrants were expecting to be greeted there and that their land was going to be there and they're going to have farms similar to being back in England. But when they arrived here, they actually found people living there. You know, that doesn't sound so flash. And so it was very difficult um, but also this New Zealand company were backed by some fairly powerful people, some politicians, um, people who were entrepreneurs, and they would actually provide backing for this. And so uh, the, um, the New Zealand co company laid claim to large areas of land, particularly in the South Island, around the um, Cook Strait area, not far from here. Huge tracts of land, um, but they didn't have any valid claims to those. And then following them, shiploads of people were starting to come to depopulate the area. So this was happening in the area at the time. And so when, um, when the British Crown heard about this, they thought that they actually needed to do something to intervene. Here's another thing that happened during this time. We had the Industrial Revolution. And so lots of factories were beginning to take place, uh, being built, mills, in England and uh, combined with the economy dropping off in the rural community, people moved into the cities and uh, conditions were cramped and um, there was a lot of crime, there was poverty and the Wakefield thought actually this would be, be a good thing to do to actually get some of these people and say why don't you come out to New Zealand, work on the farms that are there and over a period of time you'd be able to buy your own land. And so they were thinking this would be the labour force that would come out for these rich people to get richer in New Zealand here. Great idea in you know, economics, um, but actually it was just greed on their part and that caused a lot of trouble. Um, at around about this time, there was a big push from other countries like America, also um, the Netherlands, France, who felt uh, that they actually go to other countries, begin to annex countries and expand their territories. And there was uh, one guy who, um, uh, De Thierry, who I think he was born in the Netherlands, but he, he came to, uh, to the North Island and stuck a flag on the ground and declared that it was, um, he was taking sovereignty in the name of France for it, but that didn't last very long. So. You know, the amazing thing is people were coming out here believing there was nobody living in the place. So they could just come in and set up and build their own empires. There was another group who was at work in the background. This is called the Clapham sect. And they're called the Clapham sect because they lived in Clapham in England. And these were really an influential um, Anglican, um, the majority of them were Anglican um, believers and um, they were humanitarians. So they actually uh, did a lot of work regarding you know, improving conditions for those who were in prisons. And their big push was with um, the British Empire expanding, the way that they were taking over countries was not right. And when it came to New Zealand, they were actually lobbying a parliament that if they were to enter into a, um, a treaty with the indigenous people of New Zealand, it had to be different. They needed to go into it on equal terms. And so they were the humanitarians. And so a lot of the missionaries who came out here, they came out from the, what we call the Church Missionary Society. The Church Missionary Society was actually founded by the Clapham sect. Um, they also um, promoted the, abo and the abolishing of slavery and so one of their more notable uh, people was William Wilberforce, 
And unfortunately, he died just before that actually was passed into law in Great Britain with the abolishing of, um, of slavery. And then we have missionary influence. Whew, there's a lot of things actually going on in the background. So you had, um, so this is rather fortuitous. One of the chiefs from up in the, the northern area was Ruatara. And uh, being adventurous, joined one of the whaling ships, worked on there for a while, but he was badly treated by the captains, wasn't paid. And also being a chief, uh, he felt it was a, a bit below him to be doing some of the work that they were actually doing on the ships. And so he was actually beaten and uh, he was really sick. And um, he was left at one of the, the harbours and he gained transport on another ship. And on this particular ship was Samuel Marsden travelling with his wife. Saw this um, this person who actually looked really sick and what Marsden did was he actually introduced himself and nursed him back to health took him back to um, Port Jackson which is today Sydney looked after him, took him to his home and in his recovery time actually led Ruatara to Christ and then actually talked to him and showed him how to, uh, about agricultural cop, uh, crops and how to build a, um, a flour mill. And so Ruatara, being an entrepreneur himself, he thought, actually, if he could take this technology back to his people, they could actually grow crops and um, they could do trading, which is exactly what uh, which was uh, Marsden's dream. And so Ruatara, out of, out of friendship with Marsden, said, you must come over and bring your message with us. So remember um, Toiro's prophecy back in 1766. We're now in 1887, uh, in, sorry, 18, uh, in the early 1800s. So it's, it's a wee bit later, um, but God's word still stands and it's starting to happen. But Marsden, when he came to New Zealand in 1814, and in fact he preached his first message on Christmas Day, um, his his goal was first to actually civilise the Māori, teach them about farming, teach them about crops, and then they would see the good ways of how to actually provide for themselves, get into international trade, and then they would be open to the gospel. And I think part of this was an overflow of new teaching that was beginning to take place, which was introduced by Charles Darwin on evolution and saying that you know, people were developing at different stages and so uh, there was a thought that these were noble savages that they're amongst, that they need to civilise them first. And then when they're ready, share the gospel with them. And so in the, the first 10 years of missionaries being in New Zealand, not one convert. In 1823, there was a change with um, Henry Williams being brought into New Zealand and his emphasis, and so he uh, took over the leadership within New Zealand of the uh, Church Missionary Society and he was based up in the, uh, in the northern area of New Zealand. Um, and his emphasis was no more pussyfooting basically, preach the gospel and then we'll look after everything else will sort itself out. And so this, this change here began to bring about a change. And then things took off even further when William Colenso came out and with a printing press and started printing off the scriptures in Te Reo Māori. Now, the interesting thing was um, Hungi Hika, who had gone to England, had gone with Kendall, and in that time, they, he had helped them in the development of having the Te Reo Māori alphabet being developed. And um, so they now had a basis for actually translating the scriptures, portions of the scriptures, into Te Reo Māori. And when that took place, and um, Māori actually received this amazing book, they, they thought this book was magic, because uh, whoever could look at it and actually tell stories from it, actually read the stuff. But when they received it in their own hands, in their own language, they were really excited. They uh, read the gospel, they believed it, and then they obeyed it. They put it into practice. And you know, one of, the <clears throat> one of the most amazing things that they found in this, which a lot of us tend to read and then our eyes glaze over, 
is when you go to chapter 1 of Matthew, what does it start, start off with? What does it have? Is the genealogy. So when Māori saw this, their word is whakapapa, genealogy. So, so this must be true. So because for whakapapa was really important for them, it actually showed them who they belonged to, who they were connected to, and where they were from. And as they read about this atua, about this God, he had a whakapapa. And as you go through in the book of Numbers, there's heaps of whakapapa in there. And so they identified with this. And so this gave credibility for them. And as a result of this, basically revival took place throughout New Zealand. And um, one of the things I want to highlight is all of this stuff was happening at the same time. So for me, it's actually a reminder we're actually in a spiritual battle. You know, we're carrying on as we are, but there, there are forces that are actually at work behind us. And Jesus talked about this, about the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. For me, I'm, I'm intrigued that when missionaries had come and the gospel was about to be proclaimed to them, suddenly the whole nation is in uproar fighting against each other. So by the 1830s, Māori had become really weary of fighting against each other and there was a more openness to being ready to receive the gospel. So all of this um, were events that actually finally led up and contributed to the signing of the Treaty of Waitangi. One more thing is just leading into the Treaty of, of Waitangi, Hobson, who uh, was sent out to put together a, uh, a treaty. He had just a short period of time to do this, six days. Um, he um, put out an agreement and then he asked Henare Williams and his son, William Williams, to actually translate it into Te Reo Māori. And they only had overnight to do this. And uh, so that was on February the 4th. On February the 5th, a whole lot of um, rangatira chiefs from the area had been invited by Hobson to come to Waitangi and to, uh, to discuss the signing of the treaty. So this was debated all day on the 5th. And one of the things that's really significant was a lot of the Māori chiefs had built relationship and grown to trust the missionaries. Basically, they asked, uh, you know, Hinari Williams says, you, know, you are our father. We look to you to give us wisdom in what we should actually do about this. Some were opposed to signing it. Others felt it was a good thing because it would provide protection for them. And um, Hinari Williams felt it was actually would be a good thing for them to do particularly with the lawlessness that was taking place um, in the Kororareka area. And then they were aware that more immigrants were beginning to come into the country. Interesting thing is, about this time, at the beginning of the 1800s, it's estimated that there were about 100,000 Māori living throughout um, New Zealand. This is the estimate that Captain Cook gave too when he was travelling around Aotearoa. So by the time we come to the signing of the Treaty of Waitangi, Māori population had dropped. Um, we're not sure what the numbers were, but it was quite significant. A lot of it was from the fighting amongst themselves, the musket wars, and the other was uh, new diseases coming into the country. So they didn't have COVID back then, but they, they actually didn't have immunity for the diseases that came in um, with the, the new immigrants at that particular time. Um, so the, the missionaries, and the reason why I'm saying this is God's fingerprints are still working within Aotearoa. So you've got somebody in a prominent position, Henari Williams, who's actually being asked as an advisor by the Māori chiefs, and they put their trust in him. And he said, this would be a good thing for you to sign, because it would mean that you would be protected. One of the things that continues to be a big issue today was the treaty was written in two languages, one in English and the other was in Te Reo Māori. And there are some words that are actually slightly different. In the English version, it talks about in, in the, first, um, the first article in the English is that the, the independent tribes of New Zealand would grant sovereignty 
to the queen. It was now Queen Victoria who was ruling at this time. And so Māori didn't have a word for sovereignty. And in the translation in Māori, the word that's used there is kāwanatanga. Kāwanatanga is governorship. And so there's actually a big difference. So in Māori thinking, when they heard that, and they thought, yep, that's right, we're going to have British rule come in, and they're going to make sure that immigrants behave themselves. There are going to be laws, we'll obey the laws, and they're going to actually live alongside us. So basically, they're opening the, opening the door and saying, you can come live with us, and let's, let's live together, but we'll actually be in charge. We'll have tino ranga tiratanga. We will have uh, complete authority over our own affairs, over our own possessions. We'll rule ourselves, but we'll do this together. But in the British thinking was, actually, the Queen was going to be top dog, going to be the big honcho, and going to have sovereignty over Māori and anybody else that's here, and our law goes. And so things were lost in translation. And that issue continues today. And so people ask, so which is the right version? So most Māori, I think there are about 39 who signed the English one, but the rest, so we've got about 500, signed the Te Reo Māori version. And that's understandable because they could, um, although some couldn't read it, it was actually read out to them in Te Reo, heard that and they said, yes, that's me, and they put their signature to it. Um, government recognised both. And so in 1975, there was the Waitangi Tribunal Act was passed, and the Waitangi Tribunal was actually set up. And what they do is, instead of getting caught up on the differences in the wording, what they look for is the, uh, the spirit of the treaty. And, then, um, and particularly in, the, in line of what happened following the treaty, where there was um, a whole lot of stuff, particularly the alienation, alienation of our land from Māori. Whew, how are we doing? Uh, there's a whole lot. And uh, how are we doing for time? Okay. So um, the treaty was signed... And uh, one of the Māori chiefs who was in support of the signing had said this, with us signing this, the Queen will have the shadow and we will have the substance of Aotearoa. And so we'll carry on. And the reason why they, they welcomed immigrants coming here is they brought technology and also they, um, they could actually help them in their trading. And so in the, right up into the 1840s, almost 1850, the economy of New Zealand, the driving force, was actually by Māori. It was incredible, just the, the large plantations that they had set in place. There were flour mills right throughout the country. Um, they provide animals, um, cattle. Uh, they were trading internationally as well as locally. There was something like about 200 uh, fishing vessels around New Zealand, all owned by Māori. And immigrants coming into uh, New Zealand those early days actually were being fed by them. They would not have survived uh, without Māori. And uh, at the signing of the treaty, there were about, would have been about 90 to 100,000 Māori. There were about 2,000 immigrants within the country. So, you know, if Māori wanted to wipe them out, they could have done that. But within about, by about the 1860s, beyond that, populations for both were actually getting close. And there was real pressure from immigrants for land because they wanted to set up farms. And there was pressure on Māori to sell. And in the, um, in the article, with, the first article within the uh, Treaty of Waitangi was saying that the, uh, the Crown would have preemption of buying land. So if Māori wanted to sell land, they could only do that through, um, through the Crown. And so when people were coming in and saying, actually, we'd like to buy the land, and um, how much is the government offering you? We'll offer you double. They couldn't do that. And uh, so that was another source 
of um, contention for Māori later because the, the Crown could just set whatever price they wanted. Imagine that happening today. You know, if you wanted to go buy something, wanted to sell your land, and you could only do that th through the government, and they set the price that they paid you, and they may pay you, say, $5,000 an acre, and then they sell it for 100000 And it's a similar sort of thing that actually happened back then. So, there's a whole lot of stuff that happened later which is not good. And, um, and it wasn't just the Crown who uh, misbehaved. Uh, there are a lot of shady deals that actually took place. Different governors, they passed legislation which basically um, caused Māori to become powerless and um, end up in a state of poverty. But we don't have time to go into all the details um, of this right now. So my question is, as I come to bringing a close to this, is think about this, what the Crown and Māori within New Zealand here had entered into was a treaty. Another word for treaty is covenant. And so when we go through the scriptures and see what covenant means to God, we, if you have a look in Genesis chapter 12, where God begins to talk to Abraham when he places a call upon him, God talks about a sevenfold blessing that he would actually give to Abraham. I'm just going to read this for you. Uh, his name wasn't Abraham at the time, it was Abraham. And the Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And God actually um, takes steps to enter into covenant with Abraham, which is an, uh, an amazing thing. Notice I, I talk about him being Abraham because God actually changes his name. Um, and uh, that's another whole story we'd get into and we don't have time to do that right now. But there are other, other covenants. God enters into a covenant with the, the children of Israel. And basically what it is that God says, you will be my people, I will be your God. And this is how you are to live. And, um, and basically what it is, if you obey me, it will be blessing for you. Um, if you disobey me, it will not work out well. It, it's, it's actually curses that are actually mentioned. And um, you can have a look at that. We don't have enough time to have a look at that. Um, and so um, basically the, the agreement, the rules that they live under were summed up in the Ten Commandments. And I'm going to actually, be, we're going to be giving out a copy of this for you. And, and it's, it'll be a reminder. And when you have a look at that, um, there are ten, only 10 there. And when Jesus was on the planet, he was asked, you know, Master, which is the most important of the commandments? And um, he says, how do you see it? And, and basically Jesus says, actually, the most important commandment is this. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, and with all your soul. And the second is like it. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So he summed up the law and said there are those two things. Love God, love people. If you have a look at the Ten Commandments, um, one to four, talk about your relationship with God. Then five to ten is your relationship with other people. It's quite simple. And so I want you to actually to hold on to that. So here's my question for you. We're in covenant relationship with God. When God entered into covenant relationship with Abraham, his desire was that not only would Abraham be blessed, but he would be a blessing. We're in covenant relationship with God, and his desire is to bless us and for us to be a blessing. One of the things that he has called us to do is to be his representatives. In 2 Corinthians 5, verses 17 to 21, you'd be familiar with this. It starts off with this, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. 
The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. He's saying all this is from God who has reconciled us to himself and he has given us the message of reconciliation. That is, God was in Christ reconciling us to himself and he has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. So we are ambassadors for God, God making his appeal through us. And he says, we beseech you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God, who for our sake became sin, in order that we might become the righteousness of God. That's who we are. With this in mind, remember I haven't talked about what happened after the signing of the Treaty of Waitangi. We'll do that another time perhaps. But I, I would encourage you to begin to look up some of the stories. Um, stuff um, have written a whole lot of stuff, carried out a lot of research from about uh, 2018 onwards. And I'd really encourage you to have a look at that. And they talk about our uncomfortable past. And this is our heritage, not just for the crown, but also among Māori. Uh, they did some naughty things as well. Um, and that's a part of our history. But the, the story is, what do we do today as God's people? So the inception of the Treaty of Waitangi has God's fingerprints all over it through his people. We, the church, are here today. Will God's fingerprints be all over how we actually put this into practice today? I believe God's intention was to bring two people together in covenant to live and work together in a way that they would bless each other and out of that be a blessing to others who would be added to this nation. This is our challenge. Will we continue that? Will we continue that dream despite what has happened? I'm going to pray and then following this, there's a link is going to come up that's going to connect you to a waiata. It's called the National Anthem of Aotearoa. And it's sung by Cindy Ruakere. And we're going to sing this. The amazing thing about this national anthem is there actually there are five verses. Most people throughout New Zealand are only familiar with one verse. And also some of them are familiar with the first verse being sung in Te Reo Māori. So we're going to actually sing it. But I, I want you to take this also on the card that you're going to receive. We'll actually have the lyrics for this. I want you to take this, meditate on this, and uh, whenever God prompts you, pray that over New Zealand. Kia ora, ka pai. Let me pray. Lord, I want to bless you and thank you that you are at work in us by your Spirit, as you were at work through Toiroa, prophesying about the gospel that was going to come to Aotearoa, through the Clapham sect, uh, back in England, who were actually um, lobbying that there be humanitarian steps taken by the Crown in their dealings with Māori here. You sent your people, the missionaries, who carried Te Rongupai, the good news, a message of hope, a message of healing, of forgiveness, of reconciliation. And Lord, I want to thank you for the revival that broke out among Māori people in Aotearoa back in the 1800s. Lord, we sang earlier, we need revival in this land. I pray for that again. Would you move again by your spirit? Would you start with us? I ask this in Jesus' name.